So thank you, Leo. Um, that was absolutely the best introduction I've ever written. <laughs> <laughs> so here, here you are with a, a real life patent attorney in front of you, and you're probably thinking, I'm going to talk about all the, the fascinating nuances of patent law. I won't. <laughs> My wife's here today, and she can tell you that patent attorneys find things fascinating that nobody else does. But what I'm going to talk about today is in my 20 years as a, as a patent attorney and as an adjunct professor, I've never had, I, 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 it's seldom that you see inventors not do well because of lack of knowledge about patent law. That's not what's holding inventors back. And believe it or not, the thing that holds you back is fear. And it's, it's the comfort zone that you're stuck in, and I know because I was stuck there myself, and that place where you can avoid failure and the harsh judgment of others. President Theodore Roosevelt refers to this place as the gray twilight. And if you saw that poster that's outside, that's his full quote about the gray twilight. And today, I'm gonna to speak to you about a client of mine that was a medical student and he escaped the gray twilight by dropping out of medical school to pursue his invention. But first, I'd like to take you back years and years ago when I was 12 years old. Now, it may not be evident now that I'm a middle-aged adjunct professor, uh, and thanks, Leo, I didn't uh, patent the Thomas Edison's invention, so I, that's why I point out middle-aged. Uh, but at one time, I was incredibly cool and stylish. And here's proof. <laughs> you see, how many of you know what this is? And I'll, I'll pass it around. At 12, I was on a mission. My dream and sole ambition in life was to create a round Rubik's Cube. And you can tell the nerds early. <laughs> but one day, believe it or not, my mom took me to the mall. I'll pass this around too. And what I saw on the shelf crushed me. Somebody had already designed a round Rubik's Cube. And they had a better name than round Rubik's Cube. They called it the Impossible. The Impossible. And in my 12-year-old mind, they had stolen my idea. And I tried hard not to cry in front of my mother. <laughs> but does anybody know you like your mom? She had seen my, the sketchbook under my bed with page after page after page of sketches and drawings of what my round Rubik's Cube was going to look like. And as I looked up at her at 12, I was fighting back tears. I didn't cry. But my mom started crying. And at, at, at KB Toys in the mall, they've seen plenty of mothers dragging crying kids out of the store. But I was embarrassed. I had friends at the mall. Uh, and my mom's not one of these soft, gentle criers. She cries loud, and it's embarrassing. So I grabbed her by the hand, and I dragged her out of the store. The store clerks had never seen a crying mother being dragged out of KB Toys before. But see, you see, children cry when they don't achieve their dreams. And do you know why? because they actually are naive enough to think that they're achieving their dreams is possible. But what happens to us as adults? We start letting doubt set in. We start letting people convince us that our big, bold, and beautiful dreams are just fantasies. And so we start dreaming small, and we dream safe. We stay confined within this, this gray twilight that President Roosevelt talked about. And people will keep you in this gray twilight if you let them. Oprah Winfrey was told 
that she's too ugly to be on television. Walt Disney was fired by a newspaper editor for not having enough imagination. Walt Disney, imagine that. But how many of your dreams have you set aside and not pursued because somebody convinced you that you don't look the right way or you haven't gone to the right schools or you don't have the right money, connections, or, or, or social class. But what would happen <laughs> if you ignored all of this and you pushed ahead and pursued your idea anyway? Well, I'll tell you what would happen. And here's a quote by Mahatma Gandhi. First they ignore you. Then they laugh at you. And then they fight you. Kind of depressing, isn't it? The good news is, don't get too depressed, this is not the entire quote. I'll share the entire quote in a moment. But first, I want to share my dream. When I was in law school, I wanted to work at the law firm of Fish and Neve. Now, Fish and Neve is, is, as Leo mentioned, the law firm that patented Thomas Edison's light bulb, Henry Ford's ideas, Alexander Graham Bell's telephone, and the Wright Brothers airplane. Fish and Neve is to patents what like Muhammad Ali is to boxing. They were the greatest of all time. But I wasn't prepared, like Muhammad Ali, for a world that would hit so hard. Oops. <laughs> the, a world that would, like, like a punch to that, that vulnerable part of your throat that leaves you gasping for air. Like the uh, director of career placement at the University of Miami, who told me, that I didn't have a chance at working at Fish and Eve. They were the number one patent law firm in the United States, he said. They interview only at Harvard and Yale, and they only look at students that had done summer internships. Now, summer internships, I put myself through law school at night at the University of Miami, working full time during the day. I didn't have the luxury of doing a summer internship working three months and taking the rest of the year off. But I finished at the very top of my class. I aced the patent bar exam. And I ignored that placement director. And I excitedly sent in my application to Fish and Need. The fact that I'm telling you this, some of you are guessing things ended up well. They didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I got this rejection letter from Fish and Knee, and it hit hard. I couldn't sleep that night, and I tossed and turned. The next day at work, during my lunch break, and I was a structural engineer, I left the construction site I was working at, and I drove, and I drove to find a payphone. Some of you might even know what that is. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I, I mustered up all of the courage I could, because I wanted to call Ms. Rogan, the person that wrote this letter. And I did. And I reminded her that her law firms, their entire claim to fame is that they represented the Wright brothers, who were two bicycle mechanics from Dayton, Ohio, that invented the airplane, neither one of whom had even gone to college. Uh, only one of the Wright brothers had even finished high school. The, the Wright brothers didn't fit this perfect mold. Yet the world misjudged them and told them that their dream of human flight was just a fantasy. Mr. Risby, Ms. Rogan interrupts me mid-sentence. Hiring committee decisions are final. And I don't understand what your point is. The hair stood up on the back of my neck. And I figured I had nothing to lose. My point is that your hiring committee has misjudged me. And they need to look at my application again because they made a mistake. Click. I got off the phone. I'm not sure if I, it made any difference. I sure as hell felt better and ready to drive back to my 
construction site and continue. But five days later, I got another letter in the mail. My hands were trembling. I was afraid to open it. I thought I was being sued. <laughs> I, mean, I, was, I, mean, I was a law student at the time anyway. But instead, my dream law firm wrote back and extended an offer for me to join them as a patent attorney. Thank you. Here's that quote from Mahatma Gandhi again. First they ignore you, then they laugh at you. And I imagine partners sitting around a conference table saying, look at this guy from the University of Miami applying to Fish and Neve. And then they fight you. But you know what you need to do when they fight you? You fight back. The, nobody else is going to fight for your dream. If you don't stand up for it, it's going to fail. And I, I settled in well at Fish and Eve. I was learning from the absolute best patent attorneys in, in the world. But something I found was missing. The Fish and Eve that represented Thomas Edison and Alexander Graham Bell and the Wright brothers. They were no longer there. Today, I spent days in meeting after meeting in, uh, with MBAs and lawyers, just moving paper around, far removed from the uh, creative spark of an invention. The entire five years that I was at Fish and Neve, can you believe not once did I meet an inventor? It's MBAs and lawyers and, and uh, huge multinational corporations. But somewhere deep inside me was still that 12-year-old boy who could relate to inventors and wanted to represent the person who had actually come up with the idea themselves. I wanted to work with the creative geniuses that were developing new products. And I wanted to quit. And I wanted to represent Bill Gates and Steve Jobs before they became Microsoft, before they became Apple. But I was scared. How do you quit Fish and Neve? How do you, you quit when you're at the top? To me, it felt like I was jumping off a cliff, uh, leaving the stability and prestige and status of a firm that I had fought so hard to get into after five years to go out on my own. So I didn't know what to do. So what I started doing is writing emails to the absolute smartest person I know, dad, kind of like yours. <laughs> and week after week, I would write about my inner torture of working at Fish and Eve and wanting to quit this dream firm to go out on my own. And it was a family affair. I copied my mom. I copied my sisters and my brother. And week after week, I would provide them with an update on my decision, which was always no decision. I'm going to wait another week. I'm going to wait till after Christmas. I'm going to wait till the weather's warmer. Um, there's always something. Now, for two years, I continued these emails, and they became like a personal diary of mine, where I could privately share my innermost greatest fears of going out on my own. The problem is, I thought they were in private. But as email addresses work, I had one single letter wrong in my dad's email address. And for two years, I was spamming a total stranger. <laughs> And he was reading every single one of my emails. And never, never once wrote back until one day. <laughs> this perfect stranger got completely frustrated at me being stuck in my comfort zone. 
But this isn't all he said. He really took the gloves off next. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, I was starting to suspect that this wasn't dad. <laughs> but, but this single email became my tipping point. And that evening, I went home and I mustered up all the courage I could to speak to my wife, Saba, who's, who's here today, about my dream of quitting Fish and Neve, moving across the country to Florida, and starting a patent practice. And it took courage because the timing was terrible. We had a, a one-year-old daughter at the time and another baby on the way. So, honey, I want to quit and start my own firm. We have no savings. I, I have no clients. I have no revenues. I have no staff. I have no office. Will you trust me to take this chance? And I looked over at her. At that point, big third trimester <laughs> belly. And you know what she said? She said to go for it. And she said that nothing that I ever do feels like taking a chance to her. And with support like that, how can you not succeed? I, the next day at work, I went in and I told the attorneys at Fish and Eve that I'm going to quit. And what's natural at Fish and Eve, when lawyers quit, they go in-house to Motorola or uh, Exxon or some huge corporation, and they become general counsel or chief patent counsel inside the, a, a huge corporation. Where, what firm are you going to join? <laughs> I'm going to start my own law firm and represent inventors. It was as if I might as well have said I'm going to launch myself to Mars or something. They said, John, you're, 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 you're nuts. You're crazy. Do you realize this is career suicide? But the harshest sting of all was from the people who are genuinely trying to be helpful, who said that we'll hold on to your resume, not for uh, if, but for when you come crawling back. There's no stability in, in starting your own law firm. It's an incredibly risky proposition. The irony is that today, Fish and Neve no longer exists. They went under. 17 years later, my law firm is still going strong and has grown beyond my, thank you. <laughs> it has grown beyond my wildest expectations. And it all started by irritating emails to a stranger. <laughs> so my reason for being here today is that I want to be that irritating stranger to you. I want you to leave here with some discomfort. I want you to leave here thinking about that dream that you subdued, that you thought was not practical. I believe that my purpose for being born in this world is so that I can rid inventors of this feeling that they, ha they have to fit some perfect mold in order to, to launch a new idea. And that they can't launch a new product or a new idea because they are outsiders to an industry. Outsiders, like my client, Alex Gomez. Remember, he was a medical student. And what he found is that in the operating room, which is typically cold, when, you, when doctors were taking the surgical instrument and putting it into a warm body of a patient, the lens would get fogged. Believe it or not, what he found 
unbelievable is that they would then take that lens and rinse it in a bucket of water and go back inside the patient. He's a medical student, but he knew enough to know that this causes infections. And, and, and he told others about, this, uh, about his concern. He went home and he created a prototype and showed it to other doctors, other residents. You're nuts. You're crazy. He wanted to drop out of medical school to pursue this idea. Alex, this is career suicide. And I had heard this before. But when he came to my office with the crude prototype, and you guys as a group of inventors, you know what your initial prototypes look like. He put this contraption on the corner of my desk. And John, he said, I don't care what the other doctors are saying. They're labeling me a dropout. They're saying that I haven't done my residency yet. How could I possibly come up with a concept that changes the way surgical uh, uh, surgeries are conducted in the operating room? But I believe in my idea. And someday, this product is going to change the face of medicine. Two years after I filed his patent for him, and he, he said, John, please, you have to fight for me on this patent. Win this patent for me. Two years after I filed, Alex sold his idea for a hundred million dollars. And his device is used in over a million surgeries every year and saves lives. First, they ignore you. Then they laugh at you. And then they fight you. Remember when I told you this was not the entire quote? This is the full quote. Then you win. Then you win. We give our fear fancy names. We tell ourselves that giving up on our idea is being practical. We let others convince us that dreaming small and dreaming safe is being realistic. We come up with things that sound wonderful, like a cost-benefit analysis, that the cost of pursuing our idea is too high. What if the Wright brothers would have looked at the cost of, of getting inside a contraption that they built and launching it into the air? They say that death is the greatest cost. No, because we are all going to die someday. The greatest cost is not dying. It genuinely is dying with your unfulfilled dream still suffocating inside you. So have the courage to pursue your dream and then fight like hell for that dream. Ignore the naysayers. Escape the gray twilight of your comfort zone. And win. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.